Wallace Cackler, United States Navy, World War II. I interviewed Wallace here where I live locally in Grand Junction, Colorado, almost 20 years ago, August 3rd, 2005 at his home. He had just lost his wife and was very heartbroken over the loss of his wife. And Wallace has left this earth now too, and I visit him often at our cemetery here, our local veteran cemetery. But Wallace served as an electrician's mate third class with the United States Navy in World War II with the amphibious forces. He was at Iwo Jima in 1945, and he describes the, the landing more descriptive than anybody I've ever had uh, for me uh, that I've interviewed for Iwo Jima. So I, I'm really happy that you get to watch his story. I'd like to thank Kevin Shira. Kevin, thank you, first timer. Thank you for sponsoring this interview, making it possible for many others across this world to see this story of Wallace Cackler, a story that has been retrieved from my archives on the Voices of History channel. So Kevin, thank you, and I salute you. God bless you. If you'd like to sponsor one of these stories, I would encourage you to do so and consider doing so. There's information in the video description and in the comment section, and you can also find information on my website, larrycapetto.com. Wallace, I have a special place in my heart for Wallace Cackler. Like I said, I, I salute him every time I go out to the local cemetery here. And I visit him in Lenora, his wife, and uh, a lot of veterans that I've interviewed are buried out there. So, very special place for me. So I'm happy to bring you his story today. I'm excited, as I promised him almost 20 years ago, that I'd be sharing his uh, story with the world, and I am today. And he is also featured in my documentary on the Battle of Iwo Jima. So God bless you. Thank you for watching and sharing these videos and subscribing to this channel. And we'll talk to you next time. The Navy. I was with the Navy. Okay, what was your job and your rank at the time of Iwo Jima? Uh, electrician May 3rd. Okay. Where did you go into the island itself? No, it was in the amphibious forces and we were supplied, re, re, redone from a landing LST to a supply LST. There were two of us redone in Pearl Harbor that year, that, in 1943. So we were as a supply for small landing craft which could not carry their own supplies. And a lot of times their, their freighters run off and leave them while they're still in on the beach. And they come out, hey, where's my ship? Oh, well, they're headed back for Frisco. Great. <laughs> so we picked them up and took care of them. Okay. Okay. Where, where were you the night, night before the landing on February 19th? And did you tell me, tell me your involvement in the Battle of Iwo Jima, uh, maybe the night before, if you're getting ready to go in, did you work with any of the Marine troops or? No. Just, okay, just kind of tell me what your job was at Iwo Jima. Well, we were off the island the night before, and at daybreak, we stand out on a port quarter deck watching the bombing of the island itself. The Navy was doing all the bombing, and we. At daybreak got light enough, we, we could see the, the bombs as they released them, the dive bombers released them, you know. And it's, it's a miracle anything stood on that island, but then they were pretty well dug in. Mm -hmm. So we did not do anything de, de morning except, well, yeah, we grew up that morning. Uh, we had orders to lay off the beach on, on uh, Sarabachi, uh, lay off about a thousand yards and uh, till we were called. Well, we had a, Lieutenant J.G. was a skipper. He was a 90-day wonder, mm -hmm. as we called him then. Mm -hmm. And uh, he couldn't see enough action to suit him. So we pulled around at the far end of the island from Sarabachi. And he drew within a couple hundred yards of the beach and we drew mortar fire from the beach. That was when 123 guys grew up because until that time, we'd been doing all the shooting. 
and we got hit twice. The casualties were low. We only had one man seriously hurt. And, uh, but we grew up in a big hurry that morning. So then we were ordered back around to Sarabachi, over well, five, six hundred yards off the, of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And um, we were given one job. I remember there was an LCT that was floating aimlessly, a derelict. And uh, they called upon us to board her and see what was going on. Well, there had been 23 men and officers on that one, and they were all gone. Uh, we saw the results. Uh, if there was any live ones that survived, they were taken off by somebody else. But we had to go in and take care of what was left up and clean up, and they towed the thing out somewhere and sunk it. Yeah. The unit was no good anymore. And it's not worth taking back the pearl. Yeah. So, I don't remember the, what the day it was, mm -hmm. but I remember all the bells and whistles and horns and what have you in that invasion fleet turned on at once. And I saw it up here. They were raising the flag up there and they put it up. And they got it up there. And boy, it was a great day. It was a great sight because we had we'd been there for a number of days and seen them guys are pinned down on the beach, you know. It was terrible the fire they took from that mountain. Mm -hmm. So we knew that Sarabachi wasn't completely out of, out of trouble yet. Out of, well, it wasn't completely uh, uh, taken to not be a threat any longer. But anyway, we, uh, we all had quite a, quite a thrill out of that watching that. But the main thing that I think struck me the most about Iwo, outside of it being the date it was, uh, was the way those guys were pinned down on that beach. I just thank God to this day, Larry, that he spared me of all that. I went through both of them, but he spared me of all that. We were within sight of him on that black sand there, and uh, it was a terrible thing. But Iwo was not so bad as Okinawa was about what history is trying to do to us, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many things that happened in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Of course, we were there for 99 days. Well, let's so see. my memory is better of, of that than sure. it is of Iwo. But see. You've already said some things about Iwo that are good now. Um, when you said you can see the sand, I mean, how far away from the sh shore were you probably? Oh, probably three or four hundred yards maybe at the most. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, what were, what were you hearing that morning or that day? I mean, was it, was it even from that distance out, I mean, you were pretty close. I mean, were you seeing the Higgins boats going in? Could you see the LVTs going in? Absolutely, absolutely. Describe that scene, what you saw. Well, <clears throat> as the troops went in. They run in there and hit that beach. And the beach was not secured by any means. And they still drawn fire from Sarabachi. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they run right into the teeth of hell, that's all. You know, they're, 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 they're laid flat on their bellies. It's the only, the only way to escape the fire. They couldn't proceed any further. They were, they were pinned down. And a hell of a lot of them got killed that morning. We had a lot of, a lot of casualties on Evo, on some 70,000 or something like that, of uh, killed and injured. And, uh, oh, there was a lot of, you've heard this story about the boy that throws himself on a grenade to save him. Well, we had all the CMOs that were given out after Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. the, about 90% of them were for that very thing. Congressional Medal of Honor for sacrificing your life for the guys around you. Mm -hmm. And I do remember now too something else about during during that time, after we saw the flags up there and all, we went back toward the, the oh, about the middle of the island on the same side still. And uh, they had a couple of destroyer escorts in and out, maybe two, three hundred yards off the beach. Mm -hmm. Back and forth, back and forth, drawing fire, trying to draw fire. And when they did, 
there was mark fire. That's what we shot at. Mm -hmm. And so we shot up the beach pretty good. And every now and then, the destroyer out beyond us would lay a five inch round in there. Just where they were spotting the fire. Because they, they were in there close enough they could see these guys running from one cave to the other. And that was the reason that they, they uh, had us doing what we were doing and what that destroyer escorts were doing. We had to catch some circuits out in the oven, out in the open, see, so I gotta have some water. Now. I'm sorry. My mouth gets dry. Uh, okay. I have a terrible, terrible time. You, you're describing, I mean, you were, how old are you now, Wally? Well, I was, I was 18 and a half then. Uh -huh. well, I went in the Navy when I, the day after I turned 17. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I had to get out of the house. The old man and I didn't agree. And, one of those times, one of those yeah. cases in those days, there was a lot of them, you know. Well, what, what, now, you're talking about the casualties at Iwo Jima, I mean, you, and you were spared from that. I mean, there was a lot of casualties. And uh, what, what did you know about Iwo Jima before you went there? Did you know anything about the island? Didn't know a thing in the world. Mm -hmm. We never could, I could never could understand, a lot of us never could understand for many years afterwards of why we lost so many men and casualties to take that godforsaken strip of of island, and we didn't know until later that they, they did make use of the landing strips on there. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the time, we didn't know that. We didn't think it was big enough for anything like that. Mm -hmm. So we wondered why they even bothered to do it. Mm -hmm. Bypass them, run the sub patrol around the island. They could not be resupplied. They would have starved to death, the whole gang. Mm -hmm. There was, there was uh, a lot of them, a lot of them did too. Mm -hmm. uh, Prisoners. We were not taking prisoners. I don't know whether anybody knows this or not, but I watched it. I saw it. Mm -hmm. They had to get them out of the caves around the base of Sarabachi. They would, um, oh, flamethrowers, mm -hmm. and run them out of the cave. And they'd come out. They'd come out of the cave waving a white flag, waving a white flag. See, and our. After a couple of times they did this and they had some guy with them with a machine gun on his back. And you've probably seen this or heard of it before. And he'd duck down like that and they start cutting the Marines down. Well, we did away with that. Because the last time I saw a bunch of them come out of that cave, we had about four or five Jai Rings jumped up with Thompsons and just <laughs> mowed them down. We weren't taking no prisoners after that. Because of the way they were treating our, our boys on the island too, those guys that were pinned down, they get in a foxhole with them at night, sneak in there at night, and cut their throat, mm -hmm. and leave them to die like that. They couldn't, they couldn't say anything. They couldn't call for help. Mm -hmm. Lay there and bleed to death. Mm -hmm. So those were the things that, that really stuck with me the most about, like I saying, about it was the day that we grew up. We took fire for the first time. Mm -hmm. You grow up quick. You grow up in a heck of a hurry when that happens. When suddenly, hey, these guys are shooting at us. You know. mm -hmm. Did you have any friends that were killed or wounded during no, Evo? No, no, okay. no, no. There, not, were, there was no casualties on our vessel during the campaign on Evo. Tell me again what your job was off the shore. What was your job as a Navy amphib? What, what did you do? I was electrician mate. Okay. Electrician mate, third class. We had three generators in the bottom of that LST. Uh, 300 kW DC generators with six gray, or three gray marine engines pulling them. And we could produce one engine 400, 400 volts at, uh, at uh, I think it was 100 amps, 100, 200 amps, something like that. But that was my job was in the engine room. But then uh, during, during actual general quarters, I was a gunner on Sky 9, 20 millimeter. Because I, I, <laughs> I give my sad story about not being want to stay topside because I not not want to stay down below decks because I was my fear of water. I got trapped in water when I was a kid and almost drowned. Mm -hmm. So I had a fear of the water. Well, the skipper says, "Well, Cackler, you stand a lot better chance of getting hit up there." I says, "I'll take my chances at that, sir. At least I can see it coming." But to be down there, if we get hit, I will be no use to you whatsoever. So the executive officer piped up and he says, well, he, he's got a point. So they put me a Sky 9 on the 20 millimeter aft on the stern, 
number nine. We had nine 20 millimeters and I think, uh, let's see, two, four, six, eight 40 millimeters. Not much armor, but then enough scare them off anyhow. But I didn't see, we didn't, we didn't do, outside of firing into the beach, we didn't do any, any shooting at all during our ship, did not. Can you again, though, I asked you this, describe what it looked like watching those landing crafts going to shore. I mean, the sound and you, the sight, what was that like when you saw those Marines going in? And what were you thinking about them, that they were going to get killed or what? I was watching them, yes. I was thinking about the, these guys, how many of them are going to come back and how many ain't. And the way they're pinned down on that beach over there, there's a lot of them not going to make it. And again, I give thanks to the Lord because he spared me of this. He was always with me. So, What was the sight of that wave of ships? Or when you see those landing crafts circle and go in on a wave, tell me what you saw and what you heard. Well, what we saw was, like you said, a landing craft with 36 Marines on a darn darn thing. We had some of them had tanks and, and, uh, and uh, other uh, equipment on them, but they couldn't get in and land on the beach. They couldn't get them off. And uh, th this was the main trouble. They, they, they couldn't get our armor in there at all until much later. Because you go into that beach and drop, drop the ramp, and where's the guy going to go? It's like this, you know. So this, this was our trouble, not getting armor in. But yeah, they were leaving this wake behind them, of course. And I knew some of the, later on, I knew some of the bosuns and, and uh, motor machinists that were were the, uh, were the uh, motormen on those landing craft. And uh, I knew exactly how they operated and all that, and I knew what was going on, but I was standing back there more or less a spectator, seeing all this. And uh, as I say, it was, it was new to all of us. We'd never seen, never seen any action. There were no baptisms of fire at all until that time. So it was all new. And uh, we, we kind of, I can understand why Maybe the skipper thought he couldn't see enough from there. He'd never seen anything either. Mm -hmm. He was straight out of the States. Mm -hmm. He couldn't, we, we probably, without even knowing it, shared some of his feelings. Because we, we were too far off, we couldn't see much at the time. Mm -hmm. But after that, we were down in, after that encounter on the far end of the island, we uh, were down in the midst of everything going on. It was just everything going on around us. It's a, just a, uh, State of organized confusion, you might say, because the boats got in and they couldn't drop the men off, they couldn't get them off, and a lot of them had to come back to their ship, wherever they originated from. And uh, yeah, I forgot to tell you also about the morning. On the far end of the island where we drew fire, well, our skipper had sense enough to realize that we had no business being in there, so he turned her tail around to the beach and gave her an emergency flank speed ahead. We're going to get out of there. Well, there was an LCI crossing our path probably about two or three hundred yards out ahead of us. And maybe a little further, I don't know, but we saw this LCI crossing this way from us, from right to left. And when he got right in the path of where we were going to go, he hit a mine. Well, that would have been our mine. It would have been ours, but he took it. He broke into in the middle like this, and both ends just sank right there. So that was, again, the Lord was with us. He was with me anyhow. Yeah. Um, well, I did, but did you see the, don't they go in in a wave when those, Higgins boats and the... Oh, they go in, they go in uh, uh, not necessarily a wave. They start out, they can't all make the same speed. They start out and, and all maybe together, but they get there when they can. Mm -hmm. uh, there, was, there, was, uh, there was a beach director, which is directing them in, you know. But that was one of the things. We could not get a boat pool set up on the beach. Okinawa, we did, no problem. But Iwo, it was, it was too wild and too, too hairy there. We couldn't even get a boat pool set up. So that's where our ship, our LSD, came in, was... We were called a, a mothership, a supply ship. And uh, we were named, uh, we were 678 out of the shipyards in Pittsburgh. We were named out there LST 670, um, 
APB-44 as Auxiliary Personnel Barrack Ship to supply these guys in the Higgins boats that couldn't go anywhere, and they got all these guys on there, and they don't know what to do with them. We took them aboard, supplied them, fed them, put them back in their boat to go the next day. We, that was our job there. And, uh, well, I can only say that I, I've, I've, like the man says, I wouldn't give you 50 cents for trying to do it over again, but I wouldn't give you a million dollars for the experience. I was just a harebrained, shaved, <laughs> shaved tail kid when I went in. But I grew up a big hurry. Because when you see all these things around you, that you, you've seen all the practice. We did our practice landings at the beach down in Jacksonville, Florida, and so forth like that before we got out there, I see. And uh, so we, we knew what the landing procedure was, but we had no idea what was ahead of us, no idea what was there in Ebo. That was right in the jaws of hell those boys went. God, I don't even like to think about it sometimes. My mouth gets so dry, it, it, it's hard to talk. How long were you out off the coast there, off the shore? Did you stay the whole operation? Or no, no, we had 19 days. Okay. We were there only 19 days, and uh, they had managed to get a boat pool set up on the beach, some control over the landing craft, and uh, so we were no longer needed. So we retired back to Guam. Tell me, Wally, about the the uh, armada that that you were a part of when you came to Iwo, where there were hundreds of ships. Or what do you remember seeing? And tell me one, about the armada. That one had. of the one of the biggest collections of ships I'd ever seen up to that time. I mean, gee whiz, we had a couple of battleships there. We had carriers out there supplying air support, you know, and uh, there was uh, oh, there was just so many dead. No feeling anymore. That's why I'm. Well, you, look, you look really good. Well, I you don't look. get them go, but you don't know that they're, they're, they're. I can't, without telling, I, I feel something I can't tell what it is. And uh, in, in walking, sure. I have to have some kind of support all the time, or I will definitely fall over. Simple as that, fall on my face, because my equilibrium is gone. Yeah. My feet don't talk to my head anymore, okay. or vice versa. So you were 19 days. Um, I was, uh, yeah, 19 days there. And uh, did you never set up ship as a hospital ship or anything like no, that? No, like no, some no, of the no, ships no. Did. We had we had bunking space. We could take on 200 auxiliary personnel uh, for, for uh, uh, like I say, for the lost or ship for various reasons. Uh, some of them came back and their AKAs had already gone back to the states. Well, we had to take them aboard. We did take them aboard. The place for them to stay until they were assigned to get another assignment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I'll tell you, we developed a nickname there mm -hmm. in Evo. The Greeks floating Waldorf Astoria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we had everything. We had two, two bakeries, so, I mean a full, a full bakery aboard on a on main deck mm -hmm. and a uh, bunking quarters for another Quonset hut for uh, officers. And uh, they had their own, you know, you have to keep the officers separated from the enlisted men, you know. Right. You can't have them officers sitting with the enlisted men. Right. Well, that was, a th that was the, the, the way it was. That was the, the, the man mindset in those days, anyway. Mm -hmm. So we, like I say, when we got, to, they got to, they had set up a boat pool on the beach and they no longer needed us. They had other, well, it was our sister ship came in. They converted two of us in Pearl Harbor in 1943, in early 44. So there was two of us out there. So the sister ship came in and took over, and they assigned us back to Guam for the big one. Let me uh, ask you a question. I, I asked most of the veterans this question, but, um, you know, looking back 60 years, you went through World War II, and our country today, well, what what does freedom mean to you, Wally? What what does freedom mean to you? Freedom is everything. I cannot imagine myself being in a country that is not that does not have the freedom that I have here. 
If I want to go to Las Vegas, Nevada, I'll pack up and go. If I want to go to San Francisco, I'll go. I, have to, I don't have to get to, to leave the county or anything from anybody. That is, freedom is gone when those people have to do that. And most of your European countries are that way. You've got to have pass from one country to the other. Now, we do require passports in this country to, to people to visit, but we have to have a passport to the other countries where we're going to go. And uh, freedom is uh, the freedom to, to love, marry, have a family. Freedom is to go out and find a job. Freedom is to do just all the things that we, we all the things that we take for granted in this country of ours today. We just, there's so many of them that we'll never see the 1940s again. Not like it was. You know, nobody burned their flag in 1940, 41, 42, 43, 45. The mothers used to hang the stars in the windows. Have you ever heard of the Gold Star Mothers? Tell me it. Well, the silver star was for, I mean, the blue star was a boy in the military, in the service. The silver star is he's gone overseas. He is in the service, but he's left the States. He's in a foreign country. But the gold star, her boy wasn't coming back. My mother-in-law, my wife's mother, had five stars in the windows, in her window, uh, when, when uh, I married Ruby. And they were all, they were all blue at the time. And then she added one, they added one, added me, made five, when I got when I married her daughter. And then she had three silver, four silver stars in her window before it was over with. And I think worrying about the boys not coming home is probably what caused her premature death, because she worried about those boys. There's five of them out there with, you know, are they going to come home or ain't they? Now, I lost some friends that I had. You didn't make too close of friends in those days. You didn't have time for one thing. There was only one that I remember in, in my company in boot camp that went all the way through to Okinawa with me, all the way through to San Francisco when it was over with. There was only one. The rest of them, I've never been able to contact any of them after, after the war. Our, our, our contacts were, were, were fairly brief, mm -hmm. no extended uh, association with, with each other. Tell me about the Gold Star Mothers. What were you saying about that? As it was the Gold Star Mothers is when their boy was not coming back. Their boy was killed. Mm -hmm. And that's what she grieved about. Worried, worried, worried about this, that telegram that came. I'll tell you what the... Have you ever seen one of those telegrams? Do you have one? No. no. Tell, me about, tell me about the telegram and how it was delivered. Delivered by Western Union? The one whose name was Scott Carpenter, little town of Estacada, Oregon. When I came home, I went back to Estacada, and because uh, my mother and dad were there. And my, no, I came back. To, yeah, I'll come back to Estacada. And when I knocked on the door a carpenter's door, and his dad answered the door. He says, hi, Dad. I says, where's Spot? He didn't say anything. He just motioned to me, follow him. And I followed him, and he walked over to the desk, laying there face up with that telegram, Ed Black. We regret to inform you. Your son was killed in action. I don't remember whatever happened to spot the old man because we left her after that. But he was the closest one I ever came to of uh, losing. There was 14 of us boys left Estacada, Oregon in 1943.
two of us came back. Only two. So you see, God was with me. You bet your life he was with me. I didn't know him too well at the time, but he knew me. <laughs> I'm not one of these born-again Christians, kiddo. I, I came by it naturally. That changes in my life, profound changes in the last 15, 18 years that made quite a change. Tell me about the price for freedom. You've already talked about people being killed. What would you say to a young person today about the price for freedom and what we have today? A young person today, it's pretty hard to, to I think, pretty hard to, uh, to impress upon them what they have. And if I, I get in trouble with them, I say, as far as I'm concerned right now, and I mean it, if they got out of high school, they go into four years of military, immediately, unless they were going on to college. But that's what I did. I guess, of course, there was a draft, but if I'd have stayed with the draft, if I'd have waited until I was 18, mm -hmm. I'd have never seen no action at all. Because the whole time it would, it would take to process a man from an induction through that period, everything would have been over out there. So I think that the draft, it certainly, it, it, it would have gotten me if I'd have waited. But I didn't, I was all gung-ho to go. There were so many of us young men at the time that Actually, you know, this may sound a little weird, but we, we were afraid that it would all be over with before we got out there. That's what, that, that was concerned us more than anything else. I wasn't, I wasn't frightened when the kamikazes came in. I was too damn busy to be frightened. And I was never frightened when we laid off the beach and, Kamikazes were at night. When I, I just never got frightened at all. I was never really scared because I was always just too damn interested and too busy in what was going on. Were there kamikaze attacks at Iwo or at night? There was a few of them at Iwo, yes, but at night I don't know, no. Do you, do you remember recalling a kamikaze attack while you were there? Can you tell me about it? About Iwo? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't see any did direct. See, I didn't see any of them direct. That we encompass quite an area, but uh, what, what 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 does Iwo Jima mean to you today, sixty years later? What does it mean? Anything? Iwo Jima, the terrible price we had to pay for freedom. That's what it means to me. I can't hardly say tell you anything else. It was a place where we. And I made a movie after the war was over called The Sands of Iwo Jima. You remember it? I didn't go to see it for five years after it came out because I didn't think I could handle it. And my wife and I finally went and seen it after five years after it came out. Now I can see all that. I watched the war pictures. I've got uh, uh, the uh, Victory at Sea, the six volumes, complete in uh, 1959. And uh, all of those things, but to tell a young man today what he's got and what he is, some of them understand it. Like the other night, my son took me and my, my, uh, my, grand, my son and my daughter-in-law took me out to dinner. We went to uh, Rib City. And it was a young man as he was leaving, stopped. This hat was laying on the back to the table. He stopped. He says, were you actually out there? I said, yes, sir, I sure was, 1943. He said, well, I thank you, sir. I thank you very much for the service you did. Every once in a while, somebody will do this. The meaning of freedom. Oh, it's, it's like I say, it's taken so granted nowadays. People don't realize it. And the world has become a different place. My world is gone. It's gone a long time ago. I'm overdoing this one. I don't know what I'm still doing here. But God must have some reason for me being here because here I am. Well, this interview today is important to me. I'll tell you what. And, uh, well. <laughs> I, I do. I feel like, you know, you're here too for this. This is a part of a, a very historic project. And... Uh, 
Sometimes becoming a part of it today. Sometimes I'm very proud of that flag out there. And I'll show you before you leave the certificate on the wall in the other room. It's called a battleship discharge. Have you seen many of them? I think it was the old Missouri or the New Mexico, one one of the old old battleships was on a picture in in, in this and it's it's a certificate about like this. They were still giving them out when I got out in 1945, December of 45. They were still handling them out, and I still got mine. Now, all my boys was in the service after that, all three of them. They never got anything like that. Never battleship discharged. They just quit giving them for some reason or the other. I don't know why, but I feel honored to have one. It was an honor, as far as I'm concerned, to be able to go out there and do my service to my country because I loved my country at that time. And uh, uh, no, you didn't badmouth your country. You weren't very popular if you did. And the four F's had a terrible time of it. I remember, Go ahead. I remember one of them in particular was, I knew was a member of our family group, not, not a relative, but he uh, went in four F. Uh, he, he was given the opportunity to go 4F or non-combatant. He chose 4F. He went to prison in a camp. They had a camp. And that camp was no birthday camp, I'll tell you that. That was a prison camp. A lot of people don't know about them. But they had a prison camp for 4Fs. But he tried to reverse his decision and his feelings and all. They wouldn't listen to him. So to get their attention, he burned himself terrible. Kettle, a big kettle, hot stewing something, water. He deliberately pulled off the reins to scald himself. Well, after that, they believed him. He came back as 4F. He went in as non-combatant. But that's how he felt, see. Do you, do you think our society is forgetting about World War II? As I, think they, I think they are. I think they are. We, we try every year at December 7th, remember Pearl Harbor Day. How many of them remember where were you on Pearl Harbor Day? I can tell you where I was. Washing dishes in the Alpine Cafe in Ketchum, Idaho. That's where I was. I was 16 or 15 years old, going on 16. Well, I, no, no, I was 16. Yeah, I was 16. And uh, no, 15 going on 16. That's where I went. I was 16 in, uh, in uh, 42 and 17 and 43. So I was 16 years old, but I was a working kid. I was going to high school, sophomore in high school. You think we're forgetting, though, huh? I think we're forgetting. I, I just don't... Uh, for the number of people that recognize that hat and what it means, some of the young ones, but not too many young ones, most of them are the older, middle-aged, remember, like we're in... Uh, uh, went in the service directly after the World War II. The, I feel, I, I'm afraid, Larry, that we are losing our feelings for our country. This generation is. We certainly will not. But this generation is. And we had a saying in my day that my country, right or wrong. And at the time, that's the way we felt about it. We were not worried about right or wrong out there. We had a job to do. We were threatened. We were hurt. We were hurt terribly at Pearl Harbor. And we had a job to do, and we were doing it. My God, we went out there and did it. When it was over with, we came home. We marched into uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco Bay uh, after uh, to be discharged, coming home from... Uh, from Japan, and every battle, every uh, tugboat, ferry boat, uh, party boats in the bay were out there to greet us when we come under the bridge. It wasn't like it wasn't like uh, Vietnam. They was out there to greet us, and Larry, they were all playing one song. A lot of them had bands on them. They were all playing one song. You know what it was? It was not necessarily in, in unison with each other, but they, it was the same song. There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. So we come into Frisco. 
And that's where I was discharged at Frisco. And in San Francisco, your money, uh, your money as a serviceman wasn't worth a damn. You couldn't buy anything because somebody would buy it for you. Mm -hmm. If you went into a bar to, uh, to, a, to a bar to get a drink, the bartender would set it down, and if somebody didn't buy it for you, he said, it's on me. You couldn't spend your money. Mm -hmm. We didn't have much to spend anyway, but you couldn't spend it. Anyhow, but that's the way they greeted us. And on the hills in back of Oakland, on the hills behind Oakland, California, uh, with, in great big white letters, Welcome, boys, home. Thanks for a job well done. Welcome home, boys. I, 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 you've got to forgive this. It, <laughs> the gray matter is still working up there, but sometimes it gets confused. You know what I mean? Uh, like I'll walk into another room and I get in there and I'll stop and turn around. And, what did I come in here for? You ever do that? Mm -hmm. When you're doing it too early, I'll tell you that. <laughs> But it's the way we were greeted then and the way our servicemen are greeted now and then at Korea and Vietnam. And they're not getting, because they're only coming home a little back rotating in little bits, you know. It's not over over there. And I don't think it ever will be over over there. How can you, how can you fight an enemy that doesn't wear a uniform? Yeah. How are you going to do this? So how long do we think we can ever get it over with? So the, the attitude toward the servicemen is not like it was then. Yeah. There's a lot of organizations here who are trying to help out the boys, to let them know that they're, they're not forgotten and this, that, and the other. But when it's over with them, when they come home from an undeclared war, police action. It's like supposed to be in Korea, a police action. The whole lot of boys died there, I'll tell you that. For what? So at a time, by the time uh, Vietnam came around, well, those boys were treated terribly when they came home. I was really ashamed of our government, ashamed of my country, to treat them like that. Because remember the welcome we got. And I was just one of Lord knows how many of those welcomes, because I went on the cruiser Quincy, came in from, from Japan, 12 days and 14 hours straight across. Couldn't go the North Circle route because it was in December. The weather was too bad. So it's 12 days and 14, uh, 12 days and 14 hours straight across. Uh, in a man of war at that time, we were restricted to 18 knots. Now the Quincy could do 36, but we were restricted to half speed, 13, uh, 18 knots. Uh, when it's uh, uh, non non combatant, you know, no, the non non war time, see peace time because uh, it's hard on those vessels to run 18 knots. Full speed, you just don't run one full speed very long at a time. It's reserved for emergencies. Yeah. Getting out in a hurry if you have to. But as a whole thing, it's hard for me to, to describe to you, Larry, what I feel. Sometimes I, I get to remembering and I get, I get a little misty-eyed. And so long ago, it's been over two lifetimes for me. I read the, the obituaries every day. I look at them. The dates prior to 1926 and the prior after 1926. So those were the younger ones, younger than I am, that are dying every day for whatever the reason. And the older ones, they're still there, still you know, I haven't reached that mark yet. You know, I'm, I haven't reached 80, 85, or something like that. My mother was 84 when she died. She died here in the junction. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I try to remember some of them. Like I say, I, you can't see it, but on the wall behind me over here is some pictures I want you to look at when, when, uh, when this is over with. Uh, they will tell you something about my future life, my uh, past life, and uh, I don't like to move. I've been in this house since 21 years now. I've been in the valley here for 30 years. We moved to a mobile home out here, and then into here in 82, in the subdivision in 82, and I've been here ever since. 
I've had the same phone number for 30 years. Can you imagine that? Same phone number, 30 years. Can I ask, I'm going to ask you to do something that I ask all the veterans at the end of my films, okay? Okay. And I'm going to have you look into the camera for this, but when I tell you when, I want you to do a salute into the camera for me. Will you do that? How about the hat? Can I have the hat Yes, on? let me grab it, though. All you right. stay there. Yeah. I sure like that hat. I've seen a lot of those. Well, I'll tell you, this one I bought from the Service Men's Supply Catalog. It cost me $45 altogether. But I don't regret ever spending it, I'll tell you that. Now, how does that look now? Okay, sir, give me a salute into the camera. <laughs>